Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Liberty Barnes, a sociologist, ethnographer, and writer. The purpose of this video is to provide an overview of a paper I wrote with my fantastic colleague and co-author, Jasmine Flutter Johan, who is a sociology professor at Lancaster University. Our paper is called Reproductive Justice for the Invisible and Fertile, a critical examination of reproductive surveillance and stratification. We hope this paper will reach social scientists, public health researchers, clinicians, and students. In this video, I will walk you through each of the five parts of the paper. So let's begin. Part one, introduction. This paper recognizes the ability to bear children as a reproductive health issue. Here we review infertility scholarship. In recent years, several important scholars in our field have published excellent comprehensive reviews of the social science literature on infertility and reproductive technologies. Our paper is different in a couple of ways. First, it also includes an analysis of the public health literature, considering how reproduction surveillance tools, family planning assessments, and healthcare access shape infertility experiences. Second, we highlight the importance of infertility scholarship in the context of reproductive justice. We laud the scholars and activists who have developed this field and consider ways that infertility is a reproductive justice issue. In 1994, women of African descent for reproductive justice coined the term reproductive justice, which better framed reproductive rights as a social justice issue and expanded reproductive rights to include more than just reproductive control. This umbrella term also included the right to have children and the right of individuals to raise the children they bear in a healthy and safe environment. Within reproductive justice scholarship, scholars have demonstrated that the reproduction of women of lower socioeconomic means and women of color is often framed as uncontrollable, dangerous, and deviant by federal agencies. We extend this theorization of reproductive justice to consider the ways that federally funded programs overlook the infertility of various marginalized social groups. Infertility is defined as failure to conceive after 12 months of unprotected sex and failure to carry a pregnancy to a live birth. The clinical treatment of infertility has been primarily only accessible to white, middle and upper class heterosexual married women. Reproductive medicine has rendered the infertility experiences of many social groups invisible. We refer to these people as the invisible infertile, a reproductive underclass of people who are infertile, but their reproductive needs and desires go unmet because their reproduction is less valued by society. Part two a brief history of reproduction surveillance and family planning. In the 1950s, following the baby boom, social scientists began tracking the reproductive practices and patterns of Americans, including contraceptive techniques, frequency of sex, number of children, and intervals of childbearing. These surveys, which have been conducted every few years since, are called the Integrated Fertility Survey Series, or IFSS. In the 1970s, during Richard Nixon's War on Poverty, Congress passed the Family Planning Services and Population Research Act, which funded the Title X Family Planning Program. In 1978, infertility services were added to the law. In this section, we consider how these two programs, the IFSS used for reproduction surveillance and Title X used for reproductive health services have excluded the invisible and fertile. In the first case, we argue that IFSS sampling and survey techniques may have skewed or excluded many social groups, including single women, people of color, men, and gay and lesbian families. Moreover, survey skip patterns and question wording may have failed to capture the diverse experiences of women. In the second case, we found that evaluations of Title X family planning clinics do not include legally mandated infertility services beyond basic cervical and STI screening. In other words, 
Even though family planning was originally defined as helping families plan their childbearing, the term is now synonymous with contraception and reducing the reproduction of poor women, which often includes women of color. Part three, reproductive healthcare access. We know that healthcare access in the US is stratified. People with more financial resources enjoy greater insurance coverage and higher quality health care. Not surprisingly, this also applies to reproductive medicine and is amplified for people with infertility because infertility treatments may not be sufficiently covered by insurance and are extremely expensive and time consuming. Part four, discussion. So why does all of this matter? Importantly, Reproductive surveillance, family planning, and healthcare access shape and reflect our collective reproductive imaginary. Simply put, it reinforces popular beliefs regarding who should be having babies and who should not. In this section, we consider how social structures fail to address the reproductive health of disabled people and institutionalized populations. For example, People with disabilities may lack physical access to healthcare facilities, and their sexuality is more often stigmatized by providers. Institutionalized populations, such as incarcerated people, lack appropriate reproductive health care, are at greater risk of infertility causing STIs, and are not included in survey research. Part five, conclusion. Our analysis of reproduction surveillance tools, family planning programs, and healthcare access offers the following key takeaways. First, reproductive healthcare programs perpetuate the invisibility of infertility for many disadvantaged and marginalized social groups. Second, the process of invisibilization is a reproductive justice issue because it inhibits the reproduction of disadvantaged and marginalized social groups. Our analysis also calls for action. First, reproductive health initiatives must prioritize infertility diagnostics and treatments for all populations. Second, reproductive health survey tools should be designed around principles of inclusivity and equity. Third, Title X family planning funds should be used for infertility services. Fourth, Title X family planning assessments should track the use of infertility services. And fifth, to achieve reproductive health across the population, reproductive health care must be accessible to all people, regardless of socioeconomic class, race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation and abilities, including institutionalized populations. Finally, we thank you for watching this video and invite you to read our paper. Thank you.